pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to the panel discussion in conjunction with Miriam Salama's solo exhibition, The Colour of Absence, which is proudly co-presented by the City of Human and Multicultural Arts, Victoria. Um, thanks for joining us for this special conversation. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you this evening from Wurundjeri land. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of these lands and waterways and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways of Hume in which I work, the Gunung Willem Bullock people of the Wurundjeri and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging as well as to all First Nations communities who significantly contribute to life in these areas and elders from other communities who may be joining us this evening. So a warm welcome to everyone joining us and particularly to our panellists, Miriam Salama, Nur Shakembi and Dr Safdar Ahmed, who I'm sure will give us some rich and varied insights into the works and themes explored in Miriam's powerful exhibition, which I hope you've all had the opportunity to view online <laughs> by now. Um, so in a parallel pandemic-free world, we would be experiencing this work, this work as a physical installation in, in, in the Town Hall Broadmeadows Gallery. However, if that, as that's not possible, I would also like to congratulate Miriam on her first solo exhibition and thank her for her patience and adaptability in working with the online environment, which I think has worked very well. And I'd also like to acknowledge Multicultural Arts Victoria for hosting the exhibition via their website with particular thanks to Miriam Abood and Sneha Farmer for their invaluable support and enthusiasm in making it happen. So um, I just want to touch on um, briefly on our Zoom etiquette this evening. <laughs> so you will have noticed I've um, muted you all and put the videos off and um, We'll keep it that way for the duration of the of the panel this evening. Um, however, I do invite you to ask questions um, via the chat um, if you do have any. Um, if anything com comes to mind that you would like to like to ask, um, we'll have a brief Q and A at the end. So, um, yeah, if anything's pressing or playing into mind, feel free to enter it in there, and we'll ask them as as we can. Um, otherwise, I'll also ask that. Um, we don't use the chat during the panel, um, so as not to have not not to distract from the actual discussion itself, um, except for asking questions, <laughs> of course. So um, I won't take up too much more of your time. Um, I will just do a brief introduction to our panelists, um, who will each bring a, their unique experience and perspectives to the themes explored within the colour of absence. Um, which no doubt will be revealed during the discussion. But um, by way of introduction, first of all, Miriam Salama, our exhibiting artist. So Miriam is a Syrian-Australian artist whose experience as a political refugee directly informs her multidisciplinary practice. Miriam was already an accomplished artist when she fled her homeland for Lebanon in 2012 with her three remaining artworks and arrived in Australia in 2013. So as you can see in the exhibition, her works process her experiences of conflict and displacement through a multidisciplinary art practice that encompasses painting, sculpture and recently video and performance. It is driven by an obligation to acknowledge the lives of her spiritual, intellectual and political heroes as part of her own survival and adaptation to a new country. Miriam is currently studying a Bachelor of Fine Arts in the Victorian College of the Arts and has participated in many group exhibitions in Syria and overseas. Um, our next panellist is Noor Shakembi. So Noor is a Melbourne-based curator, writer and scholar who was part of the core team that established the Islamic Museum of Australia in Coburg. She served as the museum's inaugural art director, exhibitions manager and foundation curator. Noor has produced and curated over 150 exhibitions and community engagement projects including Your My, the first nationwide annual exhibition of contemporary Australian Muslim artists. She has served on numerous boards and committees, including as a commissioner for the Creative State Commissions of Creative Victoria. Nor is also a founding member of Eleven, um, a collective of contemporary Muslim artists, Australian artists, curators and writers, member of ICA, the International Association of Art Critics, and was awarded a British Council Intersect Fellowship in 2019. 
Noor engages her curatorial practice nationally and is currently an academic teacher and lecturer in the Masters of Art Curatorship course, as well as a PhD candidate in the Department of Art History at the University of Melbourne. Um, finally, Dr. Saftar Ahmed. Saftar is a Sydney-based artist, musician and acad academic. He is a founding member of the Refugee Art Project for which he conducts art workshop workshops with refugees and asylum seekers in detention. This organisation was founded to facilitate art workshops for detained asylum seekers and to display their work in public exhibitions so that detainees can express themselves through the medium of art and convey their experiences to the broader Australian community. The Refugee Art Project aims to deepen public understanding about the asylum seeker issue and the realities of Australia's detention regime. Saftar holds a PhD with the Department of Arabic and Islamic Studies at the University of Sydney. His dissertation linked the works of various Muslim reformist thinkers to contemporary paradigms of modernity and was pub published under the title Reform and Modernity in Islam. Um, prior to that, Saftar completed a Bachelor of Fine Arts at Sydney's National Arts School. He works largely in the mediums of drawing, comics and watercolour. In 2015, Saftar won a Walkley Award in the artwork category for his documentary web comic, Villawood, Notes for an Im Immigration Detention Centre. So um, that's it from me. I will hand it over to the panellists for now to, um, to dive into the conversation. So enjoy. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, hi everyone, welcome. Welcome to this panel discussion. Um, I'd like to begin as always by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking. Um, I'm actually speaking to you from Hornsby in Sydney, which is the traditional land of the Darug and Guringai people. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to, the, to their elders past and present uh, and to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. So we're going to have a panel discussion today uh, with Miriam about her artwork and Noor. But first, uh, Miriam and Noor, could you please tell us what country you're speaking from? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm speaking from Melbourne. Uh, and actually, I want to acknowledge the traditional people of the land in my uh, Arabic language. So, uh, أنا أقر وأعترف وأقدم احترامي للسكان الأصليين the Wurundjeri Wurundj people of Kulin Nation في البلد التي أعيش وأدرس وأعمل عليها وأيضا أود أن أقدم احترامي للأجداد في الماضي ولكبار السن الآن. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to acknowledge that um, I am here speaking to you from um, Wurundjeri land um, and I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways where I live and work and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Thank you. Thank you both. So we'll begin um, <clears throat> shortly with a PowerPoint presentation by Miriam discussing some of the subject matter and themes um, that are in her work and which have motivated her work. Uh, a brief introduction from me. I've known Miriam for a number of years now, about four years, I think. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I'm a big admirer of her, admirer of her art. Um, uh, we had an exhibition with Refugee Art Project of Miriam's paintings in Sydney um, last year in December uh, in the Thurning Villa Gallery in Ashfield. Um, and that was, that gave me a wonderful insight into Miriam's uh, thinking and process behind the creation of her work, albeit those paintings were very different to the works in this exhibition. And Miriam will speak, I believe, about um, how her use of materials and mediums has changed. Um, I do think Miriam's work is very brave and important, uh, particularly for um, bringing out the context of the Syrian revolution, which she experienced, the title work of the exhibition, The Color of Absence, um, for its insistence on um, 
remembering and honoring the word work of Riyadh Turk, the uh, Syrian um, uh, opposition activist to the Assad regime. So there's that context, but there's also the context of Miriam's work since coming to Australia and the way she recuperates culture and cultural objects and uh, uses the themes of memory in her work to create a place of belonging here in Australia and the messages that her work also brings to an Australian audience. So we'll try and unpack a lot of that and discuss some of that uh, this evening. Um, so Miriam, we'll go to your PowerPoint if you'd like to bring up the share screen. As the MC, I'd just like to also point out that um, uh, you're under no obligation to talk about anything that might be disturbing or upsetting uh, within these works. Um, of course, some of the themes are very heavy, um, but please only feel comfortable speaking about what you're comfortable to talk about. And that, in, that also goes for um, uh, when we field questions at the end of this panel. Okay, thank you, Safa. Put my thing on mute. Uh, so I, uh, I choose the title of my uh, current exhibition to be The Color of Absence. I, uh, I choose this title after I decide which the artwork I want to include in this ex exhibition. And I give this title, I gave this title to the main work, in, the main artwork in, uh, in the exhibition with, uh, with a two hours a black and white video. Uh, sitting all these two hours on a fabric, writing some words related to uh, detainees in my country. Uh, the, there is no specific time of being on that, that I will finish what I so it took me actually two hours until I finished what I want to create on it. The idea came after I watched the two, two documentary uh, movie uh, for uh, made by the journalist Ali Atasi, who's uh, make who who's, who made interview with Riyadh Turek, the Syrian lawyer and uh, the Syrian loudspeaker of freedom and democracy against the dictatorship in our country. And uh, this man being in uh, Assad prison for 20 years, 18 years in isolation cell. And uh, in that documentary that I highly recommend to be watched, and there is a link in the description in the in the exhibition on the website, talking about his brutal experience of being in the prison all this year, especially in the isolation cell without seeing anyone except the, a prisoner guard who uh, just came every two days to give him a mail. And uh, I choose Lento, as Riyadh Turek collects thousands of solid grains from the lentil soup that was the main mail that went to him in, while he's being in a prison and start creating image image and the drawing to kill the time and to resist this brutal experience. And I just want to tribute, to, tri to tribute his surviving and tribute his brave and all, all this kind that he, he, he had to go through in the prison and I make my interpretation to his experience. Uh, 
after I finish to do, uh, after I finish to create these two hours and uh, create the work that I need to be in black and white, as being in the prison, there is, there is no bright colors that the people can see or uh, anything, it just like surrounded by wall. He was in isolation cell with one meter by two meter alone all the time, surrounded by wall and the window and, and the door of the cell. That's why I chose to make the video to turn the video, the video to black and white. And after that, I start taking photo of the words I wrote which sometimes is the name of, pre, of detainees in Syria, like Talal Malouhi, who got, who got arrested while 18 years, and she's still until now in the prison, uh, because she speak loudly for freedom and democracy too. And Hamza Al Khatib, that uh, Riyadh Turk also mentioned in his documentary, uh, Hamza Al Khatib, the Syrian boy, really young boy who got arrested under torture in in the prison, and handed his body to his family, which it's like really hard to look to look at his body, so. Yeah, and there is some poem related also. I wrote some poems also to, det uh, to uh, detainees. I just like everything like was coming to my mind from my memory. I just, I didn't plan what I want to write while I was writing. I just, everything coming to my mind, I start put on this. Lenin. Also, I choose the sound to be uh, the sound to be surrounded by nature. That contrast, like the prison, uh, who's being in the prison, not allowed to hear. They only hear the torture of other people. Uh, in my video, you can hear the birds. Everything like freedom to the freedom. I wanted to put this and also um, uh, interview uh, with Riyadh Turk, the two film. This, this is a photo by my friend, Damon, uh, and uh, for the in in uh, The other war portrait of it, I made it by accident. I just find the duelist by accident in the room when I moved to this house. I just got it. It goes me with it goes it went with me to my memory in Syria of being of live in. I remember all the shots that didn't hit me and think what if they really hit. Feel like this really tiny, tiny solid uh, object could end a life and a possibility that thing could give us as people. Yeah, so it just like it's me to the in my country, especially first first year, first year because I just stayed in there for one year. I was surround the gunfire sound all the time. 24 hours by 24 hours that they're hearing all and many times like checking ourselves is the bullet. 
hit us or not. So I started, I started playing with it, playing with it, got slow, and also tried, uh, try to put makeup with it, tried many different things until I end up with just playing with my hands with it and turn it also to white as a uh, color I feel represent the tree. This is also image by my friend Damon Am from uh, the as uh, the gallery after we saw the artwork. This image, this video still uh, image that I created into this period making uh, sculpture with stone and wood carving pra practicing yeah when i start make me being out of the and being in and being in a new society uh having this having this complex conflict inside myself to be settled in all which sometimes the difficulty represent by the different language as a different culture uh, also the different artworks that I used to do in my country and I have to go through all this uh, until I I feel like I'm settling in. Also carrying all the distortions that the world left inside us by losing our beloved ones, losing all our houses, or our neighbor, our childhood, and all this leaves them and being in place which is feel they reflect reflect the how the others in this country seeing me as someone who came to Australia as a refugee and build their uh, first judgment about you like you are like this you are like this you are like this without trying to be more close and get to know you and to know about your country, about your culture. Yeah, so, and this performance, it wasn't should be like including in the exhibition, it should be as a, a one day event as a part of the exhibition. And in this video, I uh, did this solo exhibition, uh, I did this solo per durational performance at Immigration Museum last year. It's, it's, um, it's like how I, how it's like a stage of other projects that I start with the color of absence, the one with lentil, and how I build my idea about when Riyadh Turk in the interview talking about how he was forced to destroy all the images that he create every two days when the mail it's entered because if they're going to open the, the door of the, there is space to the image to stay 
to to fit in so he has to this all, all what he did to create to to repeat it again and the from that idea i start i start think like i want to book i want to put this rug sit on it and waving and remitting again remitting something new this i can't find the word in english i hope uh, Yeah, but uh, I'm going to repeat this experience and she is uh, she's a great artist and also she's uh, we are really friends and we're studying at VCA together. Uh, her name is Jara Story. We're going to repeat this experience uh, again together as collaboration and uh, and also because of the stage four and all restrictions that happen especially now in melbourne so it's supposed to be uh, in front of uh, broadmeadows library in public space this time not in closed space and uh, yeah and after the restriction escalated so we changed the place to be in front of my house at this nice circle street as i live in court and but also the restriction for didn't allow to be three person uh, in public space together so we're going to uh, so we're going to wait until 13th of August to see what will happen and if we can make it. Yeah. As you see, like all, all the previous artworks that I talk about, there is black and white and darkness like in the performance too and also in uh, the still video image that's from where i start seeing and they're all talking about memory lose being outside of my country all this like i feel uh, i feel they represent what i lost and my memory and and being absence of the place that I really want to be in. So I give it the color of absence because of, of the color and having the most of the art just only black and white. After that, I start because of COVID nine and being inside my place just i start discover all the things that i have in my room and what i can make from from them and all and all these objects that i make collage from and I have it from my count my country. I'm not allowed to go back to there even off as I'm demanded there for my activity in uh, for my activity in the Syrian revolution in 2011 out for the situation and the suffering of Syrian people and to now, especially through my artwork. 
So I start making collage from all this stuff that related to event and relating really no and people I lost. So this, uh, this image made from all the stuff that given to me from my art teacher who I practiced with him uh, who I practiced ultra for nearly seven years in Syria who teach me a lot and I lost him uh, and I lost him in a sad prison his name is Wael Kastoum. Um, Miriam, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're just getting a little, um, yeah, we've lost some of your audio there um, over the last couple of minutes. So um, we'll see how it is now. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's such a poignant moment <laughs> that you're talking about. But um, yeah, maybe if you can um, just start with the beginning um, of this work again, if your audio is back on. Okay. Is it Thanks, Miriam. Yes, that sounds better now. Okay. This image I great. It's from the object that given to me from my art teacher, Wael Kastoum, who practiced in his workshop for nearly seven years in Syria. And uh, you can find like there is uh, brushes, pen, gave to me while I was practicing at his workshop and also one piece of my sculpture that I made in Syria and one poem book that he gave me uh, by Mahmoud Darwish and other poem book and also this paper that talking about his death uh, because I asked him in Assad, in Assad prison. He got killed under torture. And I put in also part of my violin as I was practicing playing violin in Syria. I'm not good at it at all. And that was wearing well when I was doing activity for the revolution in my country and documenting the Assad abuses in our city homes where they were when uh, the intelligence with the army were raiding any area and attacking the Shabiha, the armed group by the by the Assad government they like raided area and stolen everything in that area and after the people for display uh, displaced from that area they're entering the area they're stolen everything in that area i was wearing this uh, job when i was uh, when i was going to document took that they were wearing all this stuff in and my recording i enter that area by uh, a camera in a shape of pen because it should be to be not seen as a camera it's so i just went went in to inside around 45, 45 in there and documenting and only all the things that they speak, which is really horrible and all this. And after that, it's uh, put it on your channel, record as a proof 
of what the army, Syrian army was doing and the intelligence. <clears throat> this uh, this close, uh, a close uh, in my memory, which you also recognize that it's more bright colors in them. from the object that I carry with me from Syria. And in here, like all my ID, my uh, student coming to Australia, and jewelry, and the extent to lose each of them. Also in here, the other photo ID, there is, uh, there is a key of painting, like painting, who's my uncle, uh, brought to me to Syria from Australia, again to Australia. Each object related to, to a story, to place, mirror, I can remember as, as an excuse to escape the intelligence with my friend, to change our, our running out from and make ourselves, ah, let's buy something to, like we are looking really for to these things and we just found it and now we, we will go back to the place that we'll go to it just in, we created uh, doing caricatures magazine and also, and also putting, uh, putting in the area putting some poem uh, in it and all this we just it was really simple as we don't have so much and we have to do it in it and distribute it with really screw stop it after we we had been mm, faced attack to the place that we in and we survived from that attack by miracle. Drawing in Syria. Actually, actually, my work in Syria, that's what I wanted to share like some of the artworks that I was made in Syria, which more more with clay and carving. This was in uh, my teacher Wa'al Kastun uh, studio when I started practicing with him. And after with the clay and after casting and molding and do portrait of my teacher, that's portrait of my teacher soon and doing this with the clay and after that casting it and do it with polesta so work with industrial stone that we make i make first from clay and casting them and after that what materials i want to finalize them after that, start playing, uh, and I made, I made the um, case from olive wood. It's my favorite wood to work in, and also this violin, as I was like really in because I was.
Frozen I really pool. interact with that and made this a sculpture from it. Also from so which in and is this also other uh, portrait uh, made by stone and this also stone. I really like with the stone. In he, and in Australia I I never, I never like uh, paint with color, always in uh, pencil and charcoal in Syria. In, in Australia, I start to explore more and expand my practice of art and start to do more painting uh, using acrylic. And sometimes my imaginations, but like affected by the situation that's happened in my country, like this image I painted after the first displacement that's happened to the last neighborhood in homes, my city. And also this image, I build them up from the image that my friend who was living under the situation and besieged area and under bombing all the time. Yeah, when they just posted about the situation in my country, I really, I really wanted to paint these people. And this two child was were sitting in the ambulance car after the bombing by the Assad regime and Russia. And they, I think you can see from the eyes and the expression in their face how, what they feel. I cried uh, actually while I was painting this image. And also, these people for refugee who went who in front of their tent. This man has to to flee from a place to other place with his books, as he has a library bookshop. And because it's really I feel really new the art in Australia from my trip. And actually it took me around four years to, to be more open to use ready-made object and to use different that I never think that I'm going to use, especially when I just arrived to Australia. But I feel now I'm more open and really enjoying to use to use this kind of material in my art practice. And I uh, did this rock with with maize or dart. It's represent country, and the darts or maize then the globe is playing on the on my land and shaving and shaving it it just like gives a sense like what's happened from make us being outside of the place that we belong to and we should be in this another work inspired i actually i inspired from uh, other artists i cannot remember his name now just related to free speech and put just use ready-made objects the typewriter with the locks as I don't I don't believe even in the countries that they claim they have a freedom and democracy uh, actually 
that is all information. And my memory, I really miss from being in Australia. I, I really miss the time that in Syria, especially in the morning, when we were gathering to have a coffee together, listening to Fairuz and all in the culture like we used to do, we used to like wake up on, uh, on Fairuz songs and having this coffee and discussion between each other before each of one going to do his job or do every day and that's every day. And I start feel uh, I want to bring the songs of Fairuz inside inside them and the pl playing how to arrange them and and just start to playing how i want to arrange them and like image from them in australia also i tried really really like i really like this experience it was in warrnambool working with the community and uh, the theme of that workshop was a and discipline and refugee crisis so would join us for three days to draw his home what homes means to him and everyone responds in different way some of them like to draw their dog or their cat. Someone uh, draw like flowers. Everyone responds in different way and go discussion about this. That start making boat from them and sign in their names on each boat and hang. installation by the people who engaged in that workshop and I really like sorry Miriam you're frozen again so <laughs> I'm sorry if you're speaking at the moment but huh? you're um, frozen yeah. again so we'll, we'll just Give it a second. I think you're better now. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Carry on. Thank you for telling me. Yeah, so I just like really, really glad that I was part of, I had this experience. I learned a lot from the discussion, especially with the kids who are like so pure, so honest, and sometimes ask really clever questions related to the situation in my country i was really surprised yeah so that's all thanks so much miriam that was a um, fascinating and deep journey through through your working process so thank you thank you for that um no i'll um throw, throw to you now a question um how do you think an exhibition like this fits within the Australian cultural landscape. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to thank Marion for sharing her, um, the amazing sort of transformation of your practice over the years from Syria to Australia, and then um, almost like a return back to um, your your earlier practice and sharing your memories and um, you know the deeply personal stories that you're sharing with us. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Safda, for the question. Um, first of all, I, I guess I'd like to start by referring back to a quote that I often like to um, think about, and that's by curator Gita Kapoor, um, and she says, it is a commitment to see the history of art in conjunction with the history of humanity, a proposition that is humble, self-evident and audacious. And I'd like to say that 
the work that Miriam is offering is at this conjunction and it is definitely, you know, sitting between humanity, um, the history of humanity and the history of art. Um, so for that reason, I, I think that um, Miriam's practice is incredibly relevant for this really, uh, I guess, unsettled time that we are going through politically, um, socially, environmentally, and in terms of um, health. Um, I, yeah, I feel like there is a lot of um, giving on the part of the artists and artists like Miriam. And with that comes the responsibility of the audience and how we receive um, the works of artists that may be seen as um, outsider artists. So oftentimes um, artists that are mig migrants that have come from refugee backgrounds that don't fit the mainstream white Anglo or Eurocentric mold um, are often seen within the arts industry, within the canon of art history, and even within society as an outsider um, artist. Um, so thinking about the work of an artist like Miriam and the audience that's receiving the work, I, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of room on the audience side to rethink or reimagine um, their own position and their own understanding when viewing you know, such deeply personal and historically relevant work. Because, you know, this is not just a story of somebody that's, you know, that's unrelated to our own experiences, um, per se. It is a story of humanity and it's something that we should be engaging with in a more, um, I guess, open and, you know, uh, I mean, I won't use the word welcoming, but in a more open way. Um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think I think I'd agree with that as well. To me, also, I think this work, in terms of what it asks of the viewer, I think it does, to a point, challenge the very sanitized or stereotypical narratives that Australians expect to hear about migrants or refugees, you know, which is this very simplified narrative of the person, the unhappy person who's forced to flee their country, who comes to Australia, who learns to assimilate, whatever that means, and is now sort of grateful, you know, for, for being here. I think real life and, and people's real journeys are far more complex, contradictory, uh, richly textured, um, than that. And I think um, the depth and the complexity of this work and the humanity of it, as you were saying, I think challenges those very shallow sort of discourses, don't you think? Um, look, definitely. And it sort of comes back to that notion of, you know, um, the someone that's deemed an outsider artist or a migrant having to perform their trauma. And, you know, there's this expectation that um, everything's sort of laid out for the audience to consume, rather than recognising that what this is, is actually a documentation of a moment in time and history, as artists often do, and are very brilliant at doing, is observing culture and observing the society around them and documenting that through a, a deeply personal and contemplative process. And it's not just about, I guess, the narrative that's in the work, it's also the materiality of it. So the choice of material has language. Um, so in the case of Miriam's work with The Colour of Absence, you know, um, we heard her sort of so beautifully speaking about her practice earlier and the use of the lentils. So drawing on um, the story of um, Riyadh and, you know, 
that he was collecting lentils and then for like the sake of his own sort of sanity and, um, you know, existence as a human being. He's, he's proving that he still exists. He's creating um, narratives, he's creating language, he's, he's, he's writing, um, he's uttering, he's, you know, being present, um, even though he's kind of vanished um, or may have disappeared. So, you know, this uh, recreating of this and the choice of um, the lentil being, you know, is incredibly, um, you know, powerful. Um, and all throughout Miriam's practice, you know, there's this sort of careful sort of deliberation of material and the layers of meaning that, um, you know, are evoked through the use of material. And not just material, there's also performing, uh, performance and um, where Miriam places her body in view of the artwork, um, in view of the audience and in proximity to um, the materials that she's using. So there's a great layering of narrative here that's not just, as you say, Safta, about, you know, that really kind of, um, you know, like single layered um, veneer. You know, this is, you know, a complex narrative. And um, from my point of view, as a, as a curator and an art historian, it's very much so a part of this idea of history. And, you know, this, what is happening now and these stories and these nuanced stories um, is the future history. So, you know, what's being documented in the presence. And this is the power of, of the art that Miriam is making in this time. And, um, you know, as I said, it's just as much um, about, you know, you know, recording or documenting as it is um, cathartic for the artist um, and not so much about, you know, people from on the outside viewing this as, um, I guess, a, a look into um, somebody else's trauma or into a part of life that they believe they're removed from. We're all like deeply connected and what's happening in Syria and the resulting political sort of um, climate worldwide is all part of a broader um, picture that we are all part of. This isn't just Miriam's story, this is our story as well, because this is the story of humanity. And, um, you know, what we do, choose to do or not to do um, is part of this story. It's, it's part of history. It's our history as humanity. So, um, yeah, I find it really interesting that um, oftentimes, you know, uh, works uh, curated or viewed um, as, yeah, this sort of external story and this person, as you say, you know, coming to Australia and sort of performing the grateful migrant role and, um, you know, having to lay everything bare. Yeah, so it's about avoiding that, that, that framing that goes on. Um, and Miriam, I think you did mention that in relation to one of your works, it was the photographs of the black and white photographs of you, um, your image distorted through glass. I think you said that related to the way people were viewing you here. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that? About uh, yeah, as I faced of in Australia, I feel like people start building uh, an idea about me, like build this narrative about me, this story about me, without coming and talk to me or start to get closer and knowing, knowing me, knowing about my culture. And I had many, like, really, uh, to use this word, but like really uh, serious things like racism, even uh, 
uh, in a place that I was studying. And also, sometimes my position and my opinion regard what's going on in my country and being for the revolution in my country and as an activist and artist in my country in the like you are terrorist you are something like this threaten to send my units that i study now in like to uh, aware them about who's the person studying in that place and all these things. So I faced ma many things. It's always like, uh, like just build an idea and just believe it and wear it to you and without even trying to, to know. Yeah, so I, I feel related to the distortion sometimes that I get from the viewer mm. who, who uh, communicates sometimes with me or who's seeing me as a person who coming from different planet mm. and also the conflict that I've been like talking about we are in new in new country we like every every refugee there is no refugee wants to leave his homeland there is a lot of people who who lived in the in their destroyed house because they refused to leave the country and what's happened in my country there is a something like for displacement which the government put the people with no choice. They bring the green buses to that area and you have to go out to other place. It's something related to politics, to the power, how making people to leave their homeland, their neighborhood, that they don't want to desist and put them in somewhere else. And after that, because the lack of every necessities of life in that place, they have to look somewhere else, sometimes not thinking for themselves, thinking for, uh, for their children or for their elder uh, parents or these people. So no one, uh, no one leave his homeland because he wants to live. No. We're just fleeing the, of being this in our country, fleeing of being detainees in, in the prison, uh, uh, fleeing the sieged area that left the people without any permission to enter any food or any medical or to them. Like we have in our country. We're fleeing our destroyed houses that we build it in our hands. And the Assad regime with the powers in all the world destroy it for us. Yeah, so, and we have like this conflict inside ourselves, how we have to settle in this new place and start from, from zero like all our life destroyed in there and we have to start from zero especially when you are in the age like 20 30 like build a new uh, start to build a new relationship with other people the new people a new language everything new and you have to deal with all of that new way of thinking new way of art which i really like took until I get along with this kind of art in Australia. Mm. And, and that's what I love about memory image as well. The, um, the photos of objects that you've collected, which you brought with you from Syria or which mean a lot to you. I think those artworks 
deal with what you've just described, the realities of displacement, a sense of loss, but also this process of recuperation um, in a really beautiful way uh, and in a way which I think is, is a bit more um, sort of related to those that warm sense of memory that everyone has, you know, in association with the things they love and the objects that we cherish, the photographs that we keep, the clothing we remember wearing, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's a really subtle and beautiful way of approaching those very big topics that you were just describing. Um, no, what, what um, any other thoughts? Yeah. Um you know, just sort of commenting on the memory images also, the, um, you know, the composition of the works, are, you know, beautifully arranged and they um, kind of remind me of miniature paintings. So the way that, you know, you can have like a whole kind of story, um, you know, contained in this one frame, in this one image and just sort of the, the the color and the depth but it's kind of almost um you know you know they're 3d objects but they appear as 2d objects so it's almost like little snippets of sort of or vignettes of your life that you've left behind but you know these are material objects that you are able to bring with you that contain those memories so yeah there's um, a lot of sort of beautiful layering in that. And, you know, there's a very stark contrast between this set of works um, being that they are colour and the rest of the works are in black and white. Um, can you sort of go into a little bit of detail as to why you chose for these particular memories to be um, so vivid and um, colourful as opposed to the um, earlier works that you're showing us? Uh, just to make sure that I understand your question, is it like why I chose this memory to, to be more colorful? Yes, yeah. Actually, uh, the object that I have from my country are really colorful. There is a lot of color in them, which which came when I start arranging them by accident to, to this image I create. Actually, I create 64 images to finalize with 11. And, and looking while I was doing this image, like I start read a lot of notes and a lot of things that I have. And do you know how I feel? I feel I'm really far from all this color and from all this brightness. I'm really far now from the times that I was in my camp and I lost a lot, you know, in my side and mm -hmm. in my stuff and in all this like pink red green i don't have this much color now in my life That's and i shot from the huge distance between me now and the one the one i left in syria so there's really two meanings in the title of this exhibition so the color of absence and when we're looking at the sort of like the key works and the videos um, in black and white, you know, the assumption there is the colour of absence is, you know, it's like a reverse of that sort of notion. Um, and, and again, even with the colourful objects that you have, um, you know, put together in these works that we can see on the screen now, um, these are colourful objects. So they are also too the colour of absence because they represent your absence. So there's a really like yeah interesting interplay um, between the the you know body of works that you have in the one exhibition, and you know you've been able to express that like so um, powerfully, and it's you know such a 
I guess it's a privilege and a pleasure to learn more about, um, you know, the process um, and the evolution of your practice through this conversation. Um, and, you know, with that, I was just sort of wondering um, where to from now, like what has happened to you as an artist through the process of making this exhibition? Um, you know, where does this lead you now in your practice? Do you feel like you've resolved this part of your narrative? Um, and what are you making now? Like what projects are you working on at the moment? Sorry, that was a lot of questions. In my no, <laughs> Basically, what are you working on now? <laughs> Sorry. At this time, as it in we are in restriction for in uh, in Melbourne. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like I'm really tired, and uh, because I'm studying at VCA and I continue practicing and and do do art for my uni. So. Actually, I have like two projects that I really want to make them, but I need to, they need a lot of time. Mm. What's called sharpener, which I need the rusty bullet, rusty, rusty empty bullet to create it. And I'm working on, it's talking about the situation in my country, how the sharpener going not just target place just going to other uh, to to different places around that place and affect it just like talking about the situation of the people in my country and how war affected us and affected the area the countries in all the world because as you said it's it's some we all related to what's it it happened in Syria and we all affected by this situation. So this is a project and there is another project also about Tainis still working on, uh, mixing between my skills that I gain in Syria, the sculpture things with, with uh, engaging a ready-made uh, object twist mm -hmm. to create inspiration from. Um, it just like I'm trying to expand and explore more with materials, with the things that I know, things that I learned in Australia. Yeah. And yeah, in my meantime, just like a drawing, doing anything like I don't have canvas, so I'm paint, I'm painting on silk paper now. Yeah, Just in relation in relation to that, uh, Miriam, we've got a question from a member of the audience, which also I think refers to your process. Uh, it's a question from Ebony McPherson, so I'll read it out to you. Ebony says. Firstly, I'd like to thank Miriam for her generosity. It's important work and I'm very glad to have experienced it. I wanted to ask when performing the work, writing out the names and poetry or the durational knitting piece, do you feel empowered within your body as well as through your artistic voice? So I think this question is referring to your performance specifically and your what you get from the physical and durational nature of those performances. Do you think it makes you feel stronger and, and is there a feeling of, of empowerment or how would you describe those experiences? Like uh, this, uh, the performance work, it was my second, uh, second one, second performance. I, uh, I, I got inspired to do performance work and start to really being interested in this kind of art from my friend Jara Story that we had, that I, I did my first one It was her, uh, it was her idea in Buxton Contemporary for two, 
for one hour. And I really like, like interact with the audience directly. Even we are not talking or just like through eyes and also the emotional things that while you are doing it. I really, I really like that the body language of the body, the unlimited dialogue that it could be mm -hmm. really open. So I, I really like that. And actually I thank Jara to introduce me to, to experience this kind of, of art and just going through it. The beginning, everything like in the two times, I feel really nervous, but after that, I just engaged with my performance and completely and doing it, but I really, I really enjoying doing that. Yeah. Mm. And I feel sometimes paintings or, uh, or like the sculptures that I've done, like the solid object, sometimes related also to my ideas that I won't share with the people. I feel sometimes with video or performance, uh, worked really w well, especially with the knitting, because I want to show that I'm unwaving and re-knitting again something new. I cannot do that only with performance. And do you think that yeah. interaction with the audience, does that give you a, does that feel good to feel their response to the work when you're there physically sort of making the work? Would you say you get any an energy from that? I don't know. <laughs> okay. no, no worries. I'm just but, interested. Yeah, but in the performance, I think the audience they are important as the performer. Mm. As like you cannot do performance without who seeing it and this kind of art it's built and former himself herself important as the audience of being there and interacting with each other who will create that dialogue and that deep connection uh, to uh, the acting and to the context con context mm. and themes that's behind the artwork mm. yes yeah i'm not sure if the energy word means this but that's how i feel okay sure yeah. sure um yeah i i personally love the color of absence i mean it's a very intense work but I think um, this sort of writing with lentils, you know, the insistence on creating something, the way Riyadh de Turk did that in his cell in isolation for so many years. I mean, I don't think you could find a stronger um, image of art as a technique of survival, you know, storytelling as a technique of 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 um keeping keeping that thing the last thing you know that they were trying to take away from him because he lost pretty much everything else in in prison mm. um under those conditions and i think um yeah it's it's very powerful the way you recreate that and i think would you say that's also analogous to your own art practice in the sense of you know um, finding inspiration in his act, but also using art to sort of cope with with historical trauma, but also the personal um, things you've experienced. I'm, I guess I'm wondering how, by communicating that through art, what you're expressing could help others 
you know, with these larger stories that, that telling mm. stories of personal loss and recuperation, as Noor said, I think are very human and universal, touch on some very universal things and how that could help, you know, Australians, viewers, the audience deal with and think deeply about the situation in Syria and what's gone on there. Would you say that, that that's a, a motivation in your work? Yes, that's motivating my work, the situation in my country, the suffering of the people in there during these nine years, from bombing to displacement to being in a prison for years. Yeah, and, and I feel I feel like after the revolution has started, it's also affect my art practice and the uh, themes that I want to cover and the things that I want to highlight through my artwork on. Like before, it's just something related to maybe beautiful things, women, something like this, you know? And something I read in uh, in novel or like I catch a sentence that I really like, I create an artwork from. After 2011, the revolution really, really changed my, my way in thinking and what I want to do in my artwork and what I want to highlight and talk through my artwork. Yeah, and all the situation now in Syria, like most of my artwork talking about this issue as I feel, I feel we really need to highlight on that issue and talking about the people who has no voice, who has really strong voice, the people in there has really strong voice to face the tanks, the bombing and all this and keep talking and keep fighting for their demands in freedom and democracy, but to just to let their voice be heard, especially that the media playing a really bad role regard what's going on. Like you are from Syria, and there is ISIS in there. There is not only ISIS. There is not, there is something else. The people different from what you think, like, you, you know, that's all effect on how we, how we look to the others. And I really want to talk about this through my artwork as I believe is the powerful language to speak through. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's a very strong note. Um, I think we need to wrap up soon. I think we're scheduled to finish at um, eight o'clock. So now I, I think now's the time for any final thoughts from Miriam, you or Noor, if you'd like to say anything in conclusion. I'd just like to say thank you. Um, it's a really powerful exhibition and um, yeah, deeply moving. And I really look forward to seeing how your art develops as well into the future. And I think your voice is extremely important um, for Australian audiences, particularly and a global audience. Um, and yeah, keep, keep creating with all the honesty and integrity and dignity and courage that you are, because it's very inspiring work. Thank you, Sophie. And, and Noor or Miriam? Yeah. Likewise, just thank you so much for sharing your practice with us today and, you know, um, for doing and making and being a, you know, culture maker and a person who is sharing truth and who's, you know, documenting and narrating and all those very important things, um, you know, to our, our culture and, um, you know, not just here but the global community and i'm really looking forward to seeing your next body of works and how your practice evolves 
and you know please keep making and keep creating and keep speaking because you've got um an incredible talent and really important stories to share thank you so, so thank you thank you I really, want, I really would love to thank you, Noor and Saldar, for being with me and being together in this panel discussion. And uh, I would love to thank Young City Council, in particular Carmen and Tobias, for all the effort and all the help they uh, gave me and to make this exhibition happen. Also, I want to thank MAV as they host my exhibition on their website and helped me a lot, in particular Miriam and Sneha. And uh, I would love also to thank my teachers as they helped me a lot. Lisa Radford and Georgina Q helped me a lot in memory image to choose which one I should include. And yeah, I just thank you so much and thank for all the people who join us today and listen and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. And thank you to everyone thank for you. tuning in. Thank you. Um, I'll also add a brief thank you um, at the end there to, to all three of you for that really generous and respectful conversation it was yeah i think um like you said there there are really powerful voices um and miriam yours is incredibly powerful both visually and when you describe your work it really really um brings to the surface a lot of ideas that we really need to spend some time with and not um and be in that space where we're not just jumping to conclusions and opinions um in the social circumstances we live in that kind of encourages us to have one opinion or another there's a, there's a lot to consider in between about personal experience and how it affects us all so thank you so much for your for your work and for the for the conversation it's i think you've left us all with a lot of food for thought tonight <laughs> Um, and again, thank you everyone so much for joining us and um, for sticking with us through the conversation. I know it was a bit tricky at times to hear, um, but I think we would have caught all of it um, in the midst of the conversation there. Um, the recording will be up online as part of Miriam's exhibition as soon as we can get it up there, as will her performance. Um, stay, stay tuned, there will be <laughs> announcements about when Miriam is able to do that in lighter the restrictions as, as they shift and move over <laughs> over the next um, few weeks hopefully so we'll see how that goes but um yes I think I think we'll call that a night <laughs> um, thanks so much everyone <laughs> <laughs>